Reggie, how are y'all? We are well. Thank you for asking. We are good. Thank you. Yeah. So we got to start this by asking the question that we ask everybody, and that is, how long have y'all been together, and how did y'all first meet? Twelve years, married for six. Yes, we've been. Yes, everything he said, and I'll, he'll give you the dates. I'll give you the the the, the story. <laughs> uh, you you want the real version of the cliff notes? Uh, <laughs> give us what you want us to have. So we've been together since 2010, but we met at a Christmas party in 2008, and it was like, it was like old school. Like I saw him from across the room type thing, and uh, he was um. He was there with a friend of his. I was there with a friend of mine. Like we had locked eyes, but then I walked over to him and uh, Mariah Carey was playing. So we started like talking about Mariah Carey and talking about music. And that was like the connector that started it. And, you know, I'm a big music head. Uh, he is, too. We eventually exchanged numbers. Yes. And then I went to another party. And this was like December of 08. So it's cold outside, snow on the ground and all of that in Brooklyn. I. uh I'm on my way to this other party, Samson, and um, all of a sudden I get this text message and it said, hey, this is Matt. It was good meeting you. And uh, so, what, you know, what are you doing? And I was saying, hey, I'm on my way to another party. So he says, oh, OK, wait, where is it? I gave him the address. Do you know he lived in the garden floor apartment of the building? Like, get out. <laughs> I did. He lived, under, he lived in the apartment underneath where the party was going on. I could have been going anywhere in the entire New York City. And I was going to that, and uh, and it was, and he, he wasn't necessarily getting along with the person that was throwing the party. So he wasn't going to try and come up. But you did come up, right? Yeah, for a few minutes. He came up for a few minutes for uh, at the party. And then I ended up coming downstairs to his place, and we sat in his kitchen and we talked. But like after the party, we sat and we talked. Uh, we talked for like we talked for a little bit. Yeah. We were a little tipsy though. We were here, you know. We did. We, we've been drinking, and I spent the night. We did things. <laughs> we did things. <laughs> we was recovering from a auto accident, yeah, right? I had a, um, shoulder surgery from being hit by the SUV. We do our thing. We wake up in the morning, and, and, and again, it was um. Wake up in the morning. I'm watching football. I love the Nebraska Cornhuskers. I'm watching football. I got a big headache. He lets me stay and gets me an Advil and lets me watch like the first half of my game. I was like, all right, thank you. I go home. Child, <laughs> I go home. And then, you know, life starts to happen. But, I'm, t you know, there was nothing bad about the evening. But we would we text each other every now and again. And he was either busy or I was busy. And he was really busy. He was, he was busy. Okay. <laughs> Long story short for me about that. I had just got out of a 10-year relationship. Two years mm -hmm. before that. But you want me to? Okay, go still ahead. Still 10 ahead. years. <laughs> at, at 10 years, I'm not really trying. I wasn't really looking for anything because I also I was, I started going. I was working and going to college full time at night. Mm -hmm. So I had a full schedule. I didn't have a personal life. Now, and, and I have to give the whole story because it's just amazing. You already thought that that was brilliant about downstairs. So two years later goes by. I'm having my 30 something. Uh, I'm having a big birthday party on some rooftop or whatever in Times Square. And I invited him. Now, at this time, we're just Facebook friends. We cool. And uh, so he decides to come and it's on this roof. It was called Sunday Sunset or something like that. He brings some boy, some date, some it model was, who had a unibrow. It was not, it was not a model. <laughs> <laughs> so he brought it. Wait, wait. OK, so he brought the, he brought him. He brought somebody he had been speaking to or something like that. He's having a good time. His friend leaves. You could correct me if I'm wrong or whatever. But then my photographer doesn't show up. So my photographer doesn't show up. The theme is Sunday sunset. I need somebody. And it's a beautiful party and all these people are having a good time. Little, little did I know he does. He likes photography. He offers to take pictures for me for the rest of the night. Three days later, I get a call. He's like, well, hey, how you doing, Reggie? You know, what are we going to do with all these pictures? And I was like, just email it to me. Who's going to email 180 some pictures? So he took 181 pictures, right? Wait. I said, all right. So he says, all right, we got to get together and look over them so we can like figure it out. And I'm still Samson at this time, just thinking this is a cute guy who I messed with once, who is just, we're just cool, right? So we decide he's going to come over to my crib and we're going to go over the pictures. We're editing and we're looking at the photos and we're talking. We're finally getting to talk. That first night that we met, 
we might have talked 15, 20 minutes and then we did our thing and I spent the night, but we really didn't sit and talk. And in the two hours that we sat on my sofa editing pictures, we really got to know each other. And he was telling me about school and how he was uh, going to night school and doing all those things. And I realized why he wasn't shady, but I would call him shady, right? So he looks over, what is this? Oh, we're, and we're eating Japanese and we both love Japanese to this day. But uh, we were, I ordered some sushi, we're eating the food, we're editing the pictures. And then Matt looks over to me and we're talking and, he, and I'm looking at him like, he's still cute. But he says, he says, um, I still find you attractive. He said he still found me attractive. Real so, smooth. <laughs> right, right. Smooth with it, still find me attractive. But wait, I was like, oh, I find you attractive. And Samson, when I tell you, then in that moment, and then he explained to me, you know, we really talked about where he had been in life and all that. So we went in and had some of the best sex. We went and it was amazing, amazing, amazing. And then from that point, we started kind of dating each other, but I hadn't really made up. I had my folks, and I think he had a folk or two. I flew to Nebraska to see my family and to see a football game. And I'm finding my, and I mind you, I'm going to play it from the Himalayas, or at least I was. <laughs> and, then, and, and so, yes, and whoever watches, they know, whatever. So I find myself texting him all the time. And he's texting me back, and I'm thinking of him all the time, like, while I'm in Nebraska. And I'm like, why am I, you know? So I said, okay, I come home and he wants to see me. Okay, great. So now I'm like, all right, I'm going to woo him now. Now this is the time where I'm going to be like, all right, you the guy. Because at this moment, I'm like, all right, I'm going to start dating him seriously. So I cooked. I made some salmon. I ran a bath. I had a whole bath. I had candles in my hallway. I got a little 20 foot hallway of candles. I'm playing Angela Winbush and Maxwell. I'm ready. <laughs> I was like, let's go. He comes over. We had an amazing night. We had an amazing night. And that was sort of the start. And, and the, 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 so that happened. I was able to woo him. And we really, and I let him know that I really, really didn't want to be with him. One week later, and this is where it all comes together. We are sitting at a bar. <laughs> I got to tell this. So we're sitting at this bar and I'm ready to profess to him that I love him. This is the guy, right? So I'm about to tell him I love him. I, I want to tell him that evening that I love him. And I think this is the guy. I look over at him and he's texting. He's got his phone out, he's texting me. But the font on it was really big because I was able to read everything. And his ex was black and Puerto Rican. And I find that he had <clears throat> an affinity, <clears throat> what I believe an affinity for Latino men or something like that, or a black Latino or something, or Oasis, whatever. So uh, <laughs> he had an affinity for these- I like, uh, well, like don't know what they are. Okay. Cool. But then I look on this text and I and the text message reads, I can't wait to see you and hug you again and all this other little shit. And the last name of the individual was Ruiz. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, here I am ready to profess my love and really just stand on, on this sword and be like, you're the one and you got these motherfuckers, you still doing what you're doing. So now I done got mad and created a whole situation and I'm upset. <clears throat> And I place it in the back of my brain and just kind of, I, I, I sit with that. Now that same, you want that part too? Put it in oh, there. <laughs> same afternoon. Wow. So we're sitting there eating wings and now I'm mad, even though I was in full of love when we sat there. Some guy from across the bar comes over and starts talking to me, black guy out of the blue. And he starts talking to me. I don't, Matt says he's flirting with me. I didn't believe he was he flirting was. with me. He, so he was with white folks and he was doing, he, I thought he was straight. I didn't know what to He gave was. him his number. He said, here's my number. I'll he gave me his Facebook. His, and, and his number and his, all the details of what he does is by his career. He told me he was about doing hedge funds and stuff like that. Anyway, and we talked, we were talking about football. We were, I love football. We we're watching football, right? Yes. Right. So the guy, so I thought we were just talking football. Matt kicks me under the table. <laughs> so I was like, okay. The, nothing ever happened with that guy. That guy, just, but that was just what happened that day. End of story. We get to my house. This again, like I told you, was the day that I was going to profess my love for him. So I'm steaming because I'm like, I can't do this. I can't because now I think you've got this other person and you've got all these things happening. We get to my apartment, the sofa that's right behind me. I can't show you now, but I'm sitting on the sofa. He's sitting on the sofa. And Samson, you ever, you know how you're sitting in a room, say like, for example, you just have the TV on and you're looking at somebody, you can see their silhouette, like the, the TV light is hitting their face and that's the only light in the room. 
Yes. I'm looking at him and I'm like, damn, this man is handsome. And I'm looking at the TV light hit him, but I'm upset. And I don't know what to say. I, mean, I have yet to, I didn't tell him that I was upset. I didn't even act like I was upset. I just kept, I just was sitting here, but my, my brain is going and going. And I'm like, oh, out of the blue. And this is how I know it was to be. He looks over to me and he's like, Reggie, he goes, guess what? What? So my friend, such and such, Ruiz, called me earlier and he's about to get married to his to his partner and he can't wait to see me and I can't wait to hug him. Basically, the part the person that I, I created a whole story because I believe that he had a whole thing going on with this guy simply because he had a Puerto Rican last name when in actuality this guy was inviting the two of us to come out to us another city to go to his wedding. And wow. Right. So I was so mad, so mad. And, and I never told him that. But then all of a sudden he tells me he gets it out of the way because what happens is it, 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 sometimes we block our own blessings. Right. Like what's for us could be standing right in front of us. And we sitting up here telling ourselves we're not worthy. So I didn't think I was just so ready for him to just jump off with this Puerto Rican or whatever. <laughs> and, and he literally he legit said to me, hey, do you want to go with me? Like, we're going to go out here to this. And, I, and, and in that moment, Samson, I said, hold on just a minute. Now, I, I have like a nine and a half foot sofa and it's long. And we're we're sitting on, I moved over, way over. And I'm not even a heavily uh, religious person, but I had a word with God. And I looked up and I was like, thank you, right? Like, I'm like, this is the person. I go in my bedroom. I delete my men for now and my Adam accounts and all of that. I deleted all of that. <laughs> Came back in the room, sat next to him. And I said, you were just waiting on me, weren't you? Not and he yet. said yes, and that's and that was and, and our anniversary is no November seventh. Uh, that was that was the week after, but we we decided we decided that our anniversary was the night that I wooed him. So I put on that night. We had made it official on the thirteenth, but we knew on November seventh that we wanted to be together. Yes, you said there was a span of two years that y'all spent, you know, uh, kind of seeing each other in passing. Do you think there were certain lessons that you two learned in your lives that kind of helped you be ready for that moment when y'all kind of click? To be ready for the moment of actually getting together? Yeah. Yes. This cause there's there was periods in my life that I still I was still need healing from, from yes. my past relationship, from stuff that I created of my own being and not being vocal to my, my partner then of how I felt and it was, a, it was a lot of miscommunication and there was a lot of communication going on. And, and I had to learn how to really communicate my feelings because I was, also, I was passive aggressive. Mm. And I had to say, you know, Pat, that's, that's not going to work and it's not healthy. You, you got to talk, you got to talk to your partner, express how you feel. Yeah, sometimes you don't, you don't have to say anything at the moment, but you're like, you know what? I can't talk about it right now. Can we talk about it later? And listen and understand and comprehend. And so that's that's what lessons I needed before, we, before I got with him. I think that knowing he had been in a 10 year relationship, let me know that he was ready for commitment and, 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 and that he knew what commitment was. Right. Not that he was ready for. I didn't think that I was. And my thought was, if I'm going to deal with anybody like serious, like if I'm really going to do this, I want to know that they are they have the capacity to uh, to uh, foster like a real relationship. And, 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 and can help teach me. So in those two years, again, we only saw each other, we see each other in passing, and we, don't, we didn't have anything negative or anything to say about each other. We would just look at each other from afar, but when we finally got together and we really talked, and I was like, wow, there were, I was like, this, this could work. He, and like he said, listening is a big deal. And yes. he actively listens. And I, and I, and I learned to actively listen because I'm a talker, but I know that. But but and it's and it so in that in that time yeah I, I hope that answers the question but 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 yeah it it, it allows us there's balance there's always a give and take of course we gotta gotta get into introducing each other to families because as as black gay men especially that is a moment depending on your background so what was that like so in my coming out I separated myself from my family for a whole year because I come from a very you know strict Southern background and it's very sometimes very um, Southern family are very closed minded mm -hmm. but my mom was like she didn't care she was more upset with me that I didn't see them for a year than 
it's, and just telling her right then and there. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm your mother. You're always gonna be my son regardless. I'm not these parents, these people you see on TV that disown their kids or throw them out in the street. I would never do that. Don't you ever do that to me. And she said, and your brothers, she said, and she said, your brothers, let me tell you about your brothers. We now. both have four brothers. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so after that, she just said that. And I said, because I said, Ma, I want to tell you. She said, What, you gay? I already knew. Anyway, <laughs> let me tell you about your brothers. <laughs> and introducing them to me. Yeah. Uh, and she loved him from day one. From day one, she was like, I like him for you. Mm -hmm. I like him for you. Yes, she gave me the blessing when I finally uh, told him, I told her I was going to uh, propose that I wanted to marry him. Um, uh, and as far as him meeting my family and, and my my family, I'm gonna be honest, I never really had a coming out. So there, there was, no, I mean, well, I kind of did, but um, I remember telling my mom, and uh, uh, I was having a conversation with a guy. I was just, I was having a laugh. I'm 19 years old or 20 or something, and I'm having, a, I'm joking with this older guy I was seeing. It. Or fucking or whatever at the time and uh i come home and i'm laughing about something but it's a joke but it's a gay joke right and i can't really talk about it to my mama my mom was like what you laughing about what's so funny and me and, me and her are like this something hit me and i was like man i gotta tell her something because i can't compromise the relationship between my mother and i just because of a joke right or i can't i want to be able to tell her anything so i sat her down and i remember to this day we sat on the porch of the apartment or of the house, and I, uh, I was, I made this whole like thing about a fence and how I had been on both sides of the fence and um, straddled the fence, and I'd been with men and women at the time, and, and we both been with women. And she says, she says what? And I said, she said you. I said I've been. With, she said you gay. I said no, I've been with both. And she was because it was a struggle to really just identify as as, as that as well. But I was like, I've been with both. She said, just make sure you put a sock on the pickle. That's, <laughs> that's what I was like. Mom was like, so, so that was my, it was, there was never a lot of, um, if there was a lot of homophobia or anything in the family or whatever, I never heard it. And I, I mean, I remember being softer as a kid and stuff like that. And I would hear things from, from people outside, but never in my house. And I, and I really thank God for that because I really didn't have a shitty, like, and it's not taking that away from anybody. That's every, everybody's journey is different, but my mother really, my mother and stepfather, uh, they kind of got out of my way. Like they allowed me to just kind of be me. And um, I had to come to terms with myself. Two years after he came home uh, for yes. New Year's uh, or 11 Christmas. into 12. So yeah, Christmas, New Year's. And I introduced him to the whole family. They had never, I had only introduced them to women before, like in that capacity. But, uh, uh, and that was it. And they loved him. And, and, it, and it's, it's really been easy to to our families loving each other. He's got all his brothers and I, I get along with. He gets along with my brothers. We finally are at the point where he's met all of my brothers. And that, that just happened last year. Um, um, so dealing with the families has actually been um, a lot better than a lot of other situations and I'm thankful. We hear a lot about how some black gay men have issues coming out. Some are in long-term relationships where they still haven't come out to their families. Do you think there's a misconception in the Black community about how we deal with sexuality? I believe there are different levels of acceptance. And, and for example, for example, I gave all that rosy stuff about my family, but my aunt didn't come to the wedding. And I'm still, you know, we're, I love my aunt. She loves me, but she didn't believe that two men should be in a union or whatnot. And, and, it, and it really hurt me because she was the only aunt for a long time. She's my mama's only sister. And, and, and but now look, looking at that, like she's very accepting. Of, it, it was not even, but it's not about her acceptance. It's about your acceptance of your experience. So yeah. when you say to me, okay, is there a misconception of the black family? We can't spend our time worrying about what our parents and other people are, how they're judging our love. So that's, so that's, so I, I don't think there's a misconception. I just think there's different levels of acceptance with each different couple, each different. I do believe that there are plenty of black folks out there that are in thriving, wonderful, same gender loving relationships that actually still have their parents on their side or that actually still, I think the church had a lot to do with that too. And, um, and, I, and I wasn't raised in the church like that, which I also believe helped me to, 
have this sort of open dialogue with my family and open, you know, I, I wasn't, um, they didn't pound the Bible on me like that. So um, there's so many different levels to that question, but I believe that everybody's entitled to their own level of acceptance. You just have to be able to accept yourself and accept like, like love is going to win either way. So that's, that's, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to put a button on that. I, I hope that. <laughs> What have been some of your biggest challenges and how have you overcome them? Look, we didn't have moments where we was on the train and we might <laughs> on the subway, where we was on the subway, we arguing, we dealing with arguments, dealing with disagreements. Um, I felt like he treated me a certain way. We're coming from the movies or something like that. I'll give it a real and I'm and I'm I'm very vocal. So I'm like, hey, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And again, another trait would be he might be, I want to put it off to another day or I don't want to talk about it where I'm like, we need to get this out now. See, we were actually, we was help, we was actually got into a full blown argument. And I don't do public displays or argument. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> at all. At all. So <laughs> we took that argument onto the subway and we're, and we're, and, and I'm this, he's this, but he's not this. He just wants like, hey, but I'm going, I'm going. He's walking through the train cars and I'm following him through the train cars. Do you know this nigga got out the, got off the train and just let me keep going? <laughs> just let me keep going. He so, left you on the train. Left me on the subway train and said, I'm not having this conversation. Like, and got off the train and he waited on the next one. But 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 I in, in hindsight, that was the best way to handle it at the time because who knows where that could have went. Luckily, we've never had to get like 5, 12 years. We might have put our hands on each other. We ain't never really put we might have we might have shook each other once. And in 12 years, and then that's the other thing. You get a lot of relationships you hear they fighting all the time and stuff like that and and a lot of people like to fight to then fuck later that's not a yeah so like like it's really so so my communicate thing, my thing i say if you gotta lay you gotta lay hands on each other you don't need to be together i agree mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. agree so uh yeah so we so if there if there's any any of those that we, we try to work on them together i i, I say <laughs> this you say challenges um I mean, just, it's about community, everything, even down to the sex, down to everything, it's about the communication, even if that's a challenge. And, and, and it's really not necessarily a challenge. Uh, there may be one that has like, maybe want some more frequent than the other, but <laughs> and that could be a challenge <laughs> sometimes. But uh, I think that, let me tell you this, I, since the beginning of our relationship, I'll drop this little dime, since we started dating, I said to him, when you leave my house or you, I leave your house, we're going to kiss each other when you leave and kiss each other when you come back. So whenever I see him, he could be in bed, style, he could be in Jersey, whatever. If he's coming into the house for the first time, this is for 12 years, Samson, every day. When he come home from work, the first thing is you better come kiss me. When I come back, you better get, we, we don't go, we try and we don't go to bed mad. You don't, you, you can't, or we at least try to work that out. Or when we do get mad, we try to talk about that. And, and yeah, we haven't had situations. I'm not trying to get cut. So <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> let's, let's work this out, you know, but, but I believe that those kisses and that respect for each other and that want for each other, like you'd be amazed what that does to you, what that does for a relationship and how it allows you to buy in to the relationship. If you know that every day, when I'm telling you, if he leaves to go to take out the garbage, or if I leave to take out the, or we, if we're leaving the, the actual house, I get a kiss before you leave. You get a kiss before I leave. And it's the small things like that, but I believe that society itself is moving away from that type of love. And I believe you have to have that. Absolutely. Kind of succeed. To put it in perspective, how many people, significant others have left their house and, and not come back? And not come back. Yeah. And so we live in New York City. New York City's crazy, especially during COVID, all that. So I just, I've always, so I said, if I'm going to be with someone, that's the type of love I want to do. You know what I mean? That's the type of communicative, physical, um, spiritual, spiritual, um, um, intimate love. And, and I believe that that helps and it's helped us for a long time. So any of those, any of those issues that we may have had, I believe that what the foundation that we've laid already allows us to fight them. I know I'm veering off, but also a person that's nice. People do not understand the power of the, having the ability to be nice. This is the nicest man I have ever 
dealt with in my head. Like I've dealt with some, I've dealt with pastors, I've dealt with all of the things, but he's kind and good and nice to me and my core. And I never felt anything different. And so those are the things I like, look for the things that make you feel good. Mm-hmm. And, and look for the things in another person that make you feel good because that's what you're going to want for the rest of your life. And just pick it back up where he said, you have to learn how to love yourself. Yeah. You can't love this. If you can't love yourself. It sounds cliche, but it's right. For your, I mean, your whole entire self, no one else can love you if you don't love yourself. No, right. And you're not going to receive that love. Yeah. You're not going to receive that love. And they could be loving on you. Like I say, at the beginning, I was still questioning my own self-love back when he was he was already ready to be like, all right, you're the guy. He was already, and I didn't know, and we talked about this later, but he was already getting there. And I had to work on some shit, my own shit to be like, am I ready for this? Am I qualified for this? Can I give him the love, the, the reciprocity that he deserves? Can I give him that? And uh, a resounding yes, I can. <laughs> and you do. <laughs> There's a Joseph Bean quote that says, Black men loving Black men is a revolutionary act. What makes us loving each other as fellow Black men, as fellow Black gay men, as Black gay men in relationships, what makes that so revolutionary? We have decided to be ourselves. So many people are strides, are trying, are, are, we look every day and we want to be like this person and this person, and this person, and everybody bases their self-worth on how they can be like this other person. I think that black men that have decided to love each other, they have already decided to love themselves and be themselves, like be fully who they are and give themselves to another man that they know may, um, may not have the same viewpoints or whatever. I think it's revolutionary because you're able to be, you're able to be dominant in your thoughts and, and comfortable in your thoughts, but then at the same time vulnerable. At the same time vulnerable and allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And so it's revolutionary because you're able to do both of those things. Mm-hmm. You pretty much said it all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, it's just for me, it's like, but especially for me, because at the time I grew up, I knew was the way it's, the youth now are able to be free and express how they really are, what they want to be. I didn't have that. I, I was not able to do that. I had to be really quiet and come to my own truth and realize like, it's okay to be that. It's okay to love another man. It's okay for another man to love you. It's okay for me to kiss another man and hug and love on and walk down the street with him and not be ostracized about it. Right. So this is the first man I was ever comfortable with. The first man, and then maybe it was some internalized homophobia way back or whatever, but the first man that I've allowed to, like, like I'll, I remember riding on the train with him and sleeping on his shoulder and just being cool with it, not caring about what anybody thought. There was a sense of peace. That's the revolutionary to come to your own peace with your peace. <laughs> We hope. Hey, I just hope that anybody watching this, it's crazy to me now that, again, coming from a side of life where I was never really a committing type person, and now I'm fully committed. But it's amazing to me now when people come and ask us for relationship advice or ask me for relationship, and and they see us social media or out and about, and they're like, "Wow, they really want what we have," and I'm and I'm proud. I'm proud because we really tried to build something that we can put in front of people and say it's legit. And another thing, just before we sign off, keep people out your business. Listen. Oh, keep come on now. Out your business. If you, I didn't even want to do this interview because I know. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, you may have certain confidants that you can go and speak to and know it's just going to be between you and that confidant. Having all these other people in your relationship doing all this, they doing this because they're miserable. And they want, what, they want what you got or they want to break up what you have and make and so you can be with them in misery. No, mm-hmm. you'd be miserable there by yourself. By yourself. That's right. That's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs>